I've talked about the fact that vibrating objects produce sound waves, and then those sound waves move through the area around them as long as there is a medium around them. But what about if the thing that's vibrating and creating the sound is also moving as well? Well, then we might experience something called the Doppler effect. And the Doppler effect is really just an apparent change in frequency of a sound due to the fact that there's some relative motion between the source of the sound and the thing receiving the sound. So I'm going to use the diagram below to try and explain what's going on. The red dot represents something that's creating the sound. So I'm going to pretend that that's an ambulance with a siren on. And it's creating a very loud sound, sending those sound waves out all around it, but the ambulance is also going to be moving down the road. So if I imagine that the thing is moving down the road in this direction, and I'm going to pretend that I'm a person observing at this end, I would actually experience a slightly different frequency than the siren is creating on its own. Because as the ambulance moves, not only is it creating sound waves, but that extra motion pushes on the sound waves and causes them in this area here in front of it to bunch together. So that extra pushing forward causes the waves to bunch up in front of the moving source. So what that bunching does is create shorter wavelengths, shorter lambdas. And so what that then does is create higher frequencies. So shorter lambdas, but higher Fs. But what about if instead of being in front of the ambulance with it coming towards me, what about if I was someone way back here? with the sound wave moving away from me. So now, what's happening is as that thing, or as in this case the ambulance moves away from me, all of the sound waves that are behind it are getting stretched out by the fact that the thing creating them is going really far away from them, and that's causing them to naturally spread out or stretch out. And that stretching then creates the opposite effect. It creates longer wavelengths, and so we see lower frequencies. So in general, if there is a moving source of sound, something that's in front of that source, or in other words, if the source is moving towards an observer, the observer will find that to be at a higher frequency. If the observer is behind, they will find it to be at a lower frequency. And you've actually experienced this if you've ever just watched a NASCAR race before. Because the cars and their sound is driving past the camera or driving past the microphone that's picking it up. And when they do that, you always hear a distinctive sound. You always hear something along the lines of, neow, neow. But recognize what kind of frequencies you're dealing with there. You're dealing with a higher frequency going to a lower frequency. Neow. It would sound really weird if it did the opposite. Neow going from low to high doesn't make sense. We always hear it from higher to lower. And that's because it's higher when those cars are driving towards the thing recording the sound, and then they get lower as the cars are driving away afterwards. So we hear a high to low transition. That's why we hear the NASCAR sound the way that we do. And so remember, the reasoning for all of this is that the wavelengths are actually changing. And this is affecting the frequencies that we hear. So the frequencies that we hear are being shifted in some way. And we can actually use a little formula to calculate how much the frequency is shifting when we actually hear it, compared to its original frequency that we would hear if the object wasn't moving at all. And in this formula, we're going to make the assumption that the person hearing the sound is stationary, that they have zero velocity. There's a slightly different version of this equation that we could use if there was some velocity of the observer as well, but we'll talk about that in class. In general, though, we use just the letter F for frequency now, but specifically, we're talking about observed frequency. So when we use F in this formula, we mean the frequency that someone would actually hear this sound as. But it's related to this other variable, F0. And that's not an O for observed, that's a zero, meaning it's the frequency 
when the thing has zero velocity. We also call this rest frequency. So if I use my ambulance example again, that would be like the frequency that the ambulance produces when it's not moving at all. So if I was just standing beside the ambulance while it was parked, while the sirens were on, I would hear its rest frequency, which we call F0, or sometimes F0. But both are just frequencies, so both will be measured in hertz. We also make use of the speed of sound, and we represent that with just a V, but we'll also represent the speed of the source, and so we'll use Vs for that. So just be careful that Vs is not speed of sound, it's going to be the speed of the source. So essentially, in order to find our observed frequency, we're just taking rest frequency and multiplying by this weird looking bracket here. And there's a lot going on in that bracket, but we need to make sure that we're getting the correct units when we do this calculation. Because we know, in the end, we should still get a frequency. We should still get something in hertz. And we're taking an, a, a rest frequency that's in hertz and multiplying it by a bunch of other stuff. So let's see what happens when we do that. So if we just focus in on what's happening on the right side of the equation, we've got something in hertz being multiplied by all that stuff that's going on in the bracket. Well. Inside the bracket, we've got a velocity on top. That's in meters per second. And then on the bottom, what that plus and minus means is that in one form of the equation, we're going to possibly add them. But in the other form, we might be subtracting them. I'll explain that in just a moment. But let's just assume for now that we're adding them. So we're taking something in meters per second, and then we're adding that with something in meters per second. That's all going on inside that big bracket. But then we can simplify a little bit. We've still got a velocity on top. It's in meters per second. And then on the bottom, we're either going to add two things that are in meters per second or subtract two things that are in meters per second. But either way, the result we get is still in meters per second. And then we still can't forget that we have hertz multiplying with all of that. Really out front, I just happened to write it afterwards, but it means the same thing. What we're seeing though is that we have meters per second on the top of this fraction and meters per second on the bottom of that fraction. And so those units in that big weird looking fraction that multiplies with rest frequency, they all cancel out. And that's why we end up with the same units in our answer as we have for rest frequency. Everything is in hertz in this case. Now, you notice that we've got a bit of a weird formula. It's got this weird looking plus and minus. And that's because depending on the situation, we'll use a slightly different version of the equation. If the source is moving towards the observer, we'll use the minus form of the equation. So we'll do V minus Vs. If the source is moving away, we'll use the plus form and divide by V plus Vs on the bottom. As long as we keep that in mind, everything else in the equation will stay the same. So let's see how we could use this formula in order to solve some real world problems. If we have, for example, a child on a swing that's screaming because she's having so much fun, and we know that at the bottom of her swing, she's moving at 5.6 meters per second, well, what about if her mother is able to measure that her scream, at least to what her mother is hearing, seems to be coming in at 1250 hertz as the child swings towards her? Can we use this to figure out what the frequency of her scream would be if the girl was sitting at rest? In other words, if she was just standing there screaming, what would the frequency be? So let's think about what we have and what we need to find. Well, we're told that the frequency her mother measures is 1250. So that is an observed frequency, what her mother is observing. And we represent that with just a regular F. That's 1250 hertz. We also know the velocity of the source is 5.6 meters per second. So at the bottom of her swing, that is how fast our child is moving. So that's how fast the source of the sound is moving. We also know the air temperature. And if you're wondering why that's going to matter in this case, just remind yourself that our formula involves the speed of sound. And if we don't know the speed of sound, we can figure it out fairly easily 
if we just know the temperature of the air. And then we just asked, what is the frequency of her scream if she is at rest? Well, that literally means the rest frequency, F0, which is a way of asking, what would the frequency be if she had zero velocity? But before we can solve this with our new equation, as I said, we're going to need to use the speed of sound. So we actually need to do a little step one first and find the speed of sound using the formula that we've used in previous lessons. So it's 332 plus 0 0.59 multiplied by the temperature, or in other words, 332 plus 0 0.59 times 25 degrees Celsius. And when you do that, I'm just going to keep all the digits that I get when I use this in my calculations. So it's about 346.75 meters per second. That is how fast the speed of sound is moving on that particular day. So with that in mind now, we can try and make use of our new formula. So in step two, I'll just start by rewriting the formula that we already know. So it says that our observed frequency is just a rest frequency multiplied by that great big bracket. It's V over V and Vs. And then we need to decide if it's going to be V plus Vs or V minus Vs. In this case, Keep in mind the fact that it says the girl is swinging towards her. In other words, the source of the sound is moving towards the thing receiving the sound. So in that case, we're going to use the minus form of this equation. If the child was swinging away from the mother, we would use the plus form. Now in this case though, we already know the F, we already know the observed frequency, and we're trying to find and isolate F0. Well, what we can see is that F0 is really just being multiplied by this great big bracket. And when we multiply it by that great big bracket, it gives us the observed frequency. But if we want to work backwards now and find the rest frequency, we could take the observed frequency and just divide by that great big bracket. So that might seem a little weird to think of, but this is what it would look like. If I just wanted to do this in one step, I could say that the rest frequency then is really just the observed frequency divided by V over V minus Vx. In other words, the observed frequency divided by that great big bracket. It looks a little bit weird, but as long as we plug everything into the correct spots, and calculate it in the correct order, we can use that version of the equation and not have to do any other solving or rearranging from here. So now if I plug in what I know, I've got that the rest frequency is 1250 hertz. I then divide by a bunch of different things in brackets. So 346.75 is my speed of sound. I'm going to take that exact same number and use it on the bottom, but also subtract the speed of the source. Subtract 5.6 meters per second. There are lots of different ways you could tackle it from here, but probably the best approach is to keep the 1250 on top in your next step, and first use your calculator to figure out all of the stuff in the bracket on the bottom. So if I put together all of the stuff in the bracket on the bottom, I believe it works out to about 1.016. So then when I take 1250 and I divide by that, I get approximately 1230 hertz. Now, in terms of significant digits, just for these Doppler equation specifically, I'd like you to just be careful with significant digits and not over round too much. So instead of using our regular significant digit rules, I'd like you to just round any of the answers that you get for Doppler frequencies to whatever number the original frequency that you were given had. So for example, we got um, the observed frequency given to us in this question and it was 1250, that had three sig digs. 
So when you do your rest frequency calculation like we did here, round to the same number of sig digs that your other frequency was. And that just gives us a little bit more accurate way that we can compare the rest frequency and the observed frequency in the end. So what we're really seeing here is that if the girl had just been standing there screaming, her scream would have sounded to her mother like it was at 1230 hertz. But because she was moving, her mother heard that at a higher pitch, at about 20 hertz greater, at 1250 hertz. That's because of this Doppler effect. In example two, you're actually given both the rest frequency and the observed frequency, and we can try and use the formula to work backwards to find how fast something might be moving. We're going to go through that in more detail in class, but you're welcome to take a stab at trying it yourself first. We're also going to take some time in class and talk about some important real-life applications for the Doppler effect that we see being used in several different areas of life.